فيفر اوف انون اوريجن The part one is about fever. The contents of this part will include the definition of fever, some perspectives about the physiology of body temperature, in normal and disease states, um, clinical assessment of a febrile patient, and general lines of treatment of fever. What about the objectives of this lecture? First, to define fever and to know the normal physiology of body temperature regulation. Uh, try to differentiate between fever and hyperthermia. And how to assess a febrile patient. And lastly, describe the treatment of a febrile patient. So today, this is the objectives of my lecture today. Some definitions. First of all, fever. How we define fever? Indeed, fever, it implies an elevated core body temperature of more than 38 degree Celsius. And most, the most common etiology of fever is usually infectious. However, there are some non-infectious conditions. So not, all, not every patient with fever usually have an infectious. It may be an infectious cause. And it is usually a characteristic of most infectious diseases, the fever. <clears throat> Some notes about the normal physiology of fever. Indeed, body temperature is regulated through two parallel processes that modify body heat balance. So this is a normal state. First of all, behavioral, for example, clothing, physical activity to raise the body temperature. And physiological, the state of skin blood flow, sweating and shivering. And the third part, uh, sorry, the both peripheral and central thermal res receptors. So we have both peripheral and central receptors in the skin and in the hypothalamus. It will provide the afferent input to the central nervous system integrity, the hypothalamic thermoregulatory central. So we have two important concepts in the regulation of the temperature, the behavioral and the physiological, and the interacting between the two it will modify the temperature of the body. Indeed, body temperature will vary from day and night. And the body is normally able to maintain a fairly state of temperature because of the hypothalamic regulatory center balances the excess heat and the production. And for example, in the if we have a do a vigorous exercise, the body temperature will rise due to thermogenesis produced by the muscles. So how will, if there is no regulations, the body temperature will rise progressively. So there is normal physiological mechanism to dissipate heat from the body through the skin blood flow sweating. So when the skin blood flow increases to the peripheries of the skin, there will be vasodilatation and excessive heat loss. And by second mechanism, which is the sweating. Sweating when evaporate, it will cool the skin. And when there is increased blood flow on the skin, it will act as a radiator to dissipate heat from the skin. So by this mechanism, the body will try to control the body temperature during physiological state. Similarly, during fever, the body it will produce skin dilatation, skin blood flow, and the capillaries of the skin, and it will promote sweating, and thus it will keep the temperature from rising to a, a certain limit. Is that clear to now, students? How the body regulate the body temperature? Doctor? Yes, Ibrahim. The core a thermal receptor that can provide a fair input to central nervous system in the integrate. Doctor, the core one of the central nervous system was in the helmet. Did this? No. The core thermal receptor in the hypothalamus. Well, integrate. Well, integrate. The hypothalamus. Yes, the hypothalamic thermoregulatory center will interact with the peripheral mechanisms. 
through the receptors present in the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus contains receptors. These receptors will interact with the peripheral skin receptors to modify the final body temperature. Is that clear? The hypothalamic regulatory center, it contains centers. These centers, the core centers, will interact with the peripheral skins to modify the output, the efferent output of the hypothalamus. Yes, yes, yes. It is in the hypothalamus. So the, in the, uh, uh, specifically in the pre-optic chiasm. So, any deviation between the control variable, the body temperature, and the theoretical reference variable, the set point temperature, result in heat loss or conservations, as I previously talked. What about the normal levels? The core body temperature is usually in the range of 36.5 and 37.5. This is the normal range of the uh, physiological temperature, the normal temperature. And it has a diurnal variation, which is uh, normally uh, present. The maximum normal oral temperature is 37.2 Celsius at 6 a.m. So it is in the nadir and 37.7 at 4 p.m. So we usually feel cold early in the morning. And late in the evening, we, we feel a bit little higher in temperature. So we feel some hotness or warmness. So this is normal daily variations of the body temperature. Is that clear? Hey, Dr. Okay. So, uh, how we can measure fever? how we can measure fever. So the definition of fever it means a temperature more than 38. So how can we can measure fever? There are two methods. We have the peripheral methods and the central methods. Anyone can know how we can measure temperature by peripheral methods? Anyone can answer this question? Yes, yeah. so it's auxiliary uh, method. Yes, right. Auxiliary method. Okay, if there is any other methods, so we can measure fever. Other methods, for example, the tympanic membrane you know, inserted in the ear, or the oral, which is the most common type, we usually to I measure the body temperature. So the oral one, by oral thermometry, axillary tympanic membrane in the ears. What about the central methods? Any idea about the central methods for measuring uh, body temperature? Uh, Dictor of rectal, rectal temperature? Yes, very good, rectal thermometry. Okay, any other can add to this question? Esophageal by using special probe to measure the uh, central, the core body temperature. So we have peripheral methods. I will repeat it again, the oral type, the axillary, and the tympanic membrane. The central methods is usually by esophageal or rectal thermometer. thermometer. So these methods have some advantage and disadvantage. What are the types of thermometer? We have either liquid-based thermometer, which is usually in the mercury or alcohol. And it, nowadays they are become rarely used because of inaccuracies and potential for fragility and fracture and will result in swallowing of the mercury or alcohol. So it's potentially toxic. And it needs uh, good calibration and professional use. So not everyone can use these methods. 
the electronic or the digital type, which is commonly nowadays in the market, used in the, in the, in the healthcare or outside healthcare settings, and the infrared, which usually measure the infrared heat produced by the body. So these are the types of thermometer commonly used to measure the temperature of the body. So you have liquid-based, electronic, and infrared. These are the examples. These are, this is the alcohol type of thermometer. And this is the digital one, digital thermometer. I think you are familiar with this uh, type. Nowadays, the uh, infrared thermometer, it is, it is a non-contact type. You have to point this device against the forehead, for example, and to measure. And this is the rectal temperature type. The rectal one, commonly used in infants, because it is difficult to measure the temperature in infants. The rectal type. While the digital thermometer, commonly used in adults to measure temperature. So clear for the types of thermometer till now? Wabhatullah? So, the peripheral methods of monitoring temperature are not as accurate as the central methods. Why? Because the oral type depends on the humidity of the oral cavity, whether the patient is mouth breather or not, it will affect the temperature of the mouth. Similarly, the axillary type, it will depend on the amount of sweating. If the patient is febrile and sweating at the same time, it will not accurate because the presence of water will interfere with the temperature uh, measurement. While the central method are accurate and has no variations, but are less practical, for example, in the rectal or the esophageal type. So it is usually not perform central method unless we have suspicion, for example, in the patient peripheral method, in the auxiliary one. Keep in mind that the peripheral methods are different in central, in central methods by the way of measurement. For example, if we use the axillary type for measurement, for example, and the temperature 36.5, we have to correct it to the central method in order to obtain the final result of fever. So 37 it will become 37, right? So 36.5 by the axillary type, we have to add 0.5 to correct it to the in reference to the oral temperature, sorry, not the central type, to the oral temperature. So the oral measurement is the reference. Oral measurement is the reference. So if we measure the by axillary type, 36.5, we have to correct it to the reference to the oral one, it will become 37. Wab Hali Hadran, how we can correct if we use the axillary method, for example, so the reference method is the oral type of measurement. So, Doctor, what do you mean? Why is the axillary 36.5 and the oral 37? Yes, because it is. We have uh, in the axillary type, it is a skin temperature, while in the mouth, it is the body cavity temperature. So the, this is the difference. The skin temperature will differ inside. It will have a difference from the inside of the mouth. Okay, so it is a cavity. The different in the cavity differs from the skin temperature. So 37.5 temperature in the axillary type, uh, we regard as fever because we, if you correct it to the temperature in the oral cavity, it will become 38. So my, axillary my skin my temperature differ from the oral temperature by 0.5, تقريباً, 0.4, 0. something, but for for a practical usage, we usually add 0.5. And the rectal temperature is usually and the rectal temperature is usually 0.5 less than the oral temperature. If the oral temperature is there 38, the rectal temperature is 37.5. That clear? The rectal temperature is 0.5 less than the oral temperature. No, peripheral, but it is usually the reference method for measurement of fever. It is usually the reference method for measurement of fever. Okay. Yeah, we measure the temperature in reference to the mouth. Okay.
The esophageal gel is also it is a central type of methods. So it is less than 0.5 than the oral temperature. So the esophageal and the rectal is usually 0.5 less than the uh, higher than the oral temperature, while the skin is the axillary type is 0.5 less than the oral one. So the central methods are usually higher, while the peripheral methods other than the oral temperature, for example, the skin axillary type is usually 0.5 less. واضح لحد الآن؟ إيه دكتور زين ال normal range اللي عدنا يعتمد يعني على يا يا method يعني. Oral. إحنا reference method هي oral نعم إحنا كلهم قيس على oral temperature yes. لهنا طلاب واضح. بالنسبة لل reference measurement of oral temperature axillary and the central for example rectal. نعم دكتور واضح. اوكي. We have another term what we call it hyperpyrexia. It is a descriptive term which means that the fever is more than 41.5 Celsius. So the difference between fever and hyperparaxia just in the magnitude of fever. When the fever reach more than 41.5, we call it hyperparaxia. Most commonly occurs in a patient with central nervous system hemorrhage, for example, in a patient with hemorrhagic stroke. However, it can be observed in patients with severe infection. So it will not differentiate between central nervous system hemorrhage versus severe infections. But what is common? It is usually seen it in the central nervous system hemorrhage. And uncommonly severe infections cause such high fever. Okay? So when a patient presents with fever more than 14.5, we have to bear in mind that may, the patient may have central nervous system hemorrhage, but it is not diagnostic. We have to rule out severe infections. So it is just descriptive term. واضحة لهنا بالنسبة لل definition of hyperpyrexia. واضحة دكتور. Just descriptive term. Here there is another term, hyperthermia. Hyperthermia differ from hyperpyrexia. Hyperthermia, it is characterized by uncontrolled increase in body temperature. Uncontrolled. So in fever, they're usually controlled body temperature by the synthesis of cytokines and prostaglandin E2 and the hypothalamic uh, receptors. So there'll be a resetting of the thermostat, for example, to from the 36.5, for, for example, to, for, to another setting point, 38. Here in hyperthermia, uh, first of all, it is uncontrolled. So the hypothalamus doesn't play a role in this circumstance. And it is sim as simple as that if we describe hyperthermia as usually overheating, overheating. So it is usually done by external stimuli rather than internal stimuli. In a way that the body temperature, that increase in the body temperature exceeds the body ability to lose heat, for example, by sweating or by uh, vasodilatation. So it is uncontrolled. And here, the hypothalamic set point is usually normal in contrast to the usual fever that occur in infections, where the production of cytokines, the pyrogenic cytokines, for example, interleukin-1 or interleukin-6, will increase the synthesis of prostaglandins in the hypothalamus, and it will reset the hypothalamic set point to a higher degree. So it will result in shivering, excess body temperature production by the muscles and the patient will feel cold and try to conserve temperature by using excessive blankets. So all of this process is controlled. While in hyperthermia, it is uncontrolled due to excess environmental production. For example, in sun exposure, where the patient is uh, exposed to uh, direct sunlight, 
for several hours without protection. This will cause overheating. And I, I, uh, I took, for example, if we, يعني ده نخلي مثلاً إناء من الماء يعني نطبعه ونضل نفور به إحنا إحنا لا نفور مو صح ولا so it will exceed the temperature in contrast to the the normal physiology so it will overheating just overheating and the hypothermic doesn't play a role in this process so if you call it hyperthermia. واضحة بالنسبة للهايبرثيرميا طلاب بالنسبة للهايبرثيرميا واضحة واضحة ليك نعم اكو سؤال لحد الان دكتور دكتور بالهايبرثيرميا نعم وهم نتخلص منها بالطرق الاعتيادية اللي هي سويتنج وغيرها مو But usually in hyperthermia, the normal mechanism to dissipate heat is usually insufficient. So, hyperthermia, because the normal ability to lose heat is usually insufficient due to excessive heat production. So there's imbalance between excessive heat production and heat loss. So the end result is hyperthermia. The end result is hyperthermia. So when we treat this patient, it's usually not by antipyretics, right? Because the hypothermic set point is normal. If we treat him with, for example, paracetamol, it will not be effective in contrast to the febrile patient due to flu-like illness, for example, and in, in influenza. The antipyretics will be effective because it will reset and block the synthesis of prostaglandin E2 in the brain and will bring back the, the hypothalamic set point to a normal level, for example, from 39 to 36. And by, by setting the hypothalamic thermostat again, this will result in the body try to lose heat by vasodilatation and excessive heat, excessive, uh, sorry, sweating production. While in hyperthermia, the hypothalamic set point is usually normal. واضحة لحد الآن بالنسبة للهايبرثيرميا؟ أي دكتور واضحة نعم هي انديد هايبرثيرميا يوجوالي أكرز ان انفيرومنت يعني يعني فور اكزامبل اوتدور وركرز اثليتس ان هوت انفيرومنت ديدنت تيك انف ووتر سو ديهايدريشن از ا بريديس از ا ريسك فاكتور فور هايبرثيرميا سبيشالي ان هوت ووت ان هوت ويذر For example, in summer, or sometimes, sometimes, if the patient uses drugs that block the sweat production, drugs that block sweat production. Anyone can know this drug? We can go to pharmacology. Or bad. Atropine, doctor. Atropine. Yes, anticholinergic drugs. Anticholinergic drugs. يعني عادة أتروبي مني مريض مني أخذ أتروبي. يعني the common drugs that has Atropy-like action, for example, tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic antidepressant will cause dry skin. So on the body temperature, when the athletes, for example, do his exercise, there will be excessive, excess normal thermogenesis from the muscles. And the patient expo and the athlete exposed to sunlight. So there will be excess heat production. And on the other hand, the sweat gland is, or is unable, are unable to produce sweating to cool the skin. So by this mechanism, the, this uh, person will be exposed to hyperthermia. There are some diseases that also may cause hyperthermia. For example, in thyroid storm, it is an uncontrolled release of thyroid hormones, and it will result in an excessive production of heat from the muscles. So it will, we call it thyroid storm. Okay, how we can assess the febrile patient? It will begin with taking good history. And on the other hand, the differential diagnosis is very broad. So the clinical features that accompany the fever will guide the most appropriate investigations. 
So what are the potential clues for fever in the setting of infectious process? We have to, we either approach this patient into the body parts, for example, in the upper body part, for example, sinusitis, pharyngitis, and the lung, tuberculosis, lung abscess. So the patient will give us clues to the history. For example, in sinusitis, the patient, in addition to fever, will complain of nasal blockage, rhinorrhea, pharyngitis, sore throat, cough. If we have suspicion of infection in the lung, the most common symptom is cough, chest pain, shortness of breath. On the contrary, if we have a patient pain in the abdominal region and a company with fever, we have to suspect an abdominal pathology related to the infectious process. For example, in the hepatic abscess, the patient will complain of abdominal pain. What is the character of abdominal pain related to the liver? It is usually in the right hypochondrial area. So when a patient presented with fever, right hypochondrial pain, we have to think about an infection in the liver in general or it may be in the gallbladder, cholecystitis, and in the loin area. So we have, so these are the potential clues. So fever alone is very different, it has very many, many causes that will, many infectious causes that cause fever. So we have to define the diagnostic clues in the history. So the patient will tell us, I have abdominal pain with fever, I have chest pain, for example, I have sore throat. So these are potentially diagnostic clues. Right, hy right hypochondrial pain. We have to think about in male or in female also the append appendicitis. In women, it may be tube or ovarian abscess. Skin is also an important uh, infectious cause to produce fever. And there are multiple spectrum of infection in the skin, ranging from impetigo, erysipelas, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, and the patient will complain of redness in the skin, or as simple as boil, or severe pain, and discoloration of the skin in necrotizing fasciitis, or only, for example, muscle pain, severe muscle pain, localized muscle pain, for example, in the thigh. This will pinpoint to the polypyomyositis, which is infection of the muscle, or infection of the bone, osteomyelitis. So the patient may complain of fever for several weeks and localized bone pain, and this we should exclude osteomyelitis, and etc. Headache is also an important hint to the infection in the central nervous system, though it is not specific, because sinusitis will also produce headache. So brain abscess, encephalitis, will, will produce headache as a potentially diagnostic clue. So headache and fever, you have to rule out central nervous system infection. Very important, the chronology. What do you mean by chronology? The sequence of events that precede fever. How? By exa for example, exposure to other infected individuals. For example, patient with cough. Who met a patient diagnosed TB recently or diagnosed with pneumonia recently. So by asking the patient, do you have any contact with other sick patient? This will give a, uh, a clue to the fever of this patient or exposure to vectors of disease. For example, traffic to endemic area in malaria, for example, in India. So a patient presented with fever, if we don't take traveling history properly, you may miss malaria if you have traveled to an endemic area and etc. So you have to be aware about the potential exposure and the chronology of when that, that present the fever. For example, potential exposure to an infected and sick patient or to endemic area or these diseases are prevalent. So it will facilitate to reach the diagnosis, the underlying diagnosis of fever. Otherwise, fever alone has very, very differential or broad differential diagnosis and more than 100 million causes. 100 causes, sorry. Yeah, so there are many causes of fever. And we could not define a diagnosis of fever without reaching a differential, good differential diagnosis and provisional diagnosis by asking a thorough history. What about the management of fever? The management of fever, usually by use of antipyretics. 
and it is usually not contraindicated. So the use of antibiotics is not contraindicated in the setting of fever. So many physicians will uh, treat fever with antibiotics, and it is not contraindicated. But it may mask the signs of infection, which is fever, right? So when the patient treats him with antibiotic, we don't know the pattern of resolution of infection. Because most of the, we follow most of the infections, most of the infections with fever. The presence of fever denotes an infective process. So by, by giving antibiotic, it will mask the infection. So withholding of antibiotic therapy can be helpful in evaluating of the effectiveness of a particular antibiotic. So if you give antibiotic, for example, in a patient presented with a pneumonia, we expect a resolution of one of the earliest signs of resolution of the infective process is defervescence, which is uh, the temperature returned to normal. So if we give the antibiotic, it will mask this process. So we have to follow the patient by other parameters. So give the antibiotic in, in the necessity. Don't overuse the prescription of the antibiotics. So the routine use of antibiotics can mask an adequately treated bacterial infection. Yeah, the real antibiotics, the antibiotics, the antibiotics for bacterial pneumonia. They take it day by day and give it to the patient. After that, they remove it, and the antibiotic is So it will lead to an adequate bacterial treatment for whatever the cause. On the other hand. Treatment of fever in some patients is highly recommended. Can you list me some causes when the treatment of fever is obligatory or is very is very indicated? Dr. I have shot the central nervous system effect. Yes, central nervous system infections. And for example, meningitis. It does not. Dr. Uh, no. By which mechanism do you affect? Yes, very good. In, uh, so, in a patient with febrile seizure, treatment of fever is indicated. Okay, this is number one, febrile seizures. Do you know other indications? Fever. The enzyme is no. enzyme Yes. Enzyme so in the setting of, of hyperparaxia. Yes. In the setting of hyperparaxia. So temperature more than 41.1. Okay. Other indication? Normally, in fever, there will be an increase in the cardiac output. Right? So one of the manifestation of fever is palpitation, tachycardia. Right? So... In a patient with underlying cardiovascular disease, for example, angina, it will increase the oxygen consumption from the myocytes. So the, the, it will, so a fever, it may precipitate angina by increasing oxygen consumption. So a patient with underlying cardiovascular disease who develop fever, it should be treated vigorously. Right? And in patient with, for example, respiratory disease, COPD, Fever will increase the, metabol the basal metabolic rate and increase oxygen consumption. And the patient who underlying respiratory disease cannot compensate for this increase in oxygen consumption. So a patient with a respiratory or cardiac disease will, will be harmed by fever. So in these settings, fever should be treated. Wab Hatullah, Hadilan, Mr. Treatment of Fever. Okay, we move to the next slide. So the objectives in treating fever are reduce the elevated hypothalamic set point, for example, from 39 to 37, and facilitate heat loss by excess sweat production. So what are the drugs used in the treatment of fever? We usually know that the aspirin and acetaminophen, other non-steroidals and corticosteroids. These are the usual treatments 
the pharmacological treatments of fever. The non-pharmacological treatment of fever, do you know the non-pharmacological treatment of fever? Yes, cold sponges. Cold sponges are also effective way for between why? What is the basis of using the cold sponges? دكتور لأنه كل قطرة ماء تتبخر يعني قبل كذا من الحرارات. Yes, when the water evaporates from the surface on it, it will absorb some temperature. So by evaporating the water, it will facilitate cooling of the skin. So this is non-pharmacological, which are usually effective in the modest temperature, for example, 38, 38.5. But in higher temperature, if we need to decrease the body temperature, we have to use the antiparatics. The famous one is oral aspirin and oral astaminophen. And they are equally effective in reducing fever in humans, whether aspirin or astaminophen. What are the mechanisms of antiparatic agents? It usually block, uh, they are usually block the synthesis of cyclooxygenases, uh, whether it is COX-1 and COX-2, which are potent antiparatics. So there is a direct correlation between the antiparatic potency of various drugs and their ability to inhibit brain cyclooxygenase. So by acting on the brain cyclooxygenase, antiparatics will decrease the synthesis of pyrogenic cytokines and it will result in resetting of the body temperature to the normal setting. So the brain have cyclooxygenase and these antiparatics will act on this cyclooxygenase to, to break the production of COX-1 and COX-2, which are potent antiparatics. because the synthesis of a prostaglandin E2, which is the normally inhibition of the, uh, to the normal, which has a receptor, sorry, which has a receptor in the hypothalamic set point, which prostaglandin, prostaglandin E2. This, this uh, prostaglandin expressed by enzyme cyclooxygenase. So by breaking cyclooxygenase will result in decrease in the synthesis of prostaglandin E2, which is also an important production of pyrogenes. Another antipyretic is corticosteroids, which are also effective as antipyretic, which act in two levels. Corticosteroids will reduce prostaglandin E2 synthesis and the brain, and it also blocks the trans transcription of messenger RNA for the pyrogenic cytokines. So to block the synthesis and also block the prostaglandin E2 synthesis by two mechanisms, on the cellular level and on the synthesis of pro prostaglandin E2. While high cell lab, the use of antiparatics, we have three types uh, aspirin, astaminophen, other non steroidals, norofermatin, for example, ibuprofen, acinaminophenic acid, daclofenac. These are also, all of these are non steroidal, which will block the synthesis of COX 1 and COX 2, which are the mediators of fever by two mechanisms the synthesis of COX 1 and COX 2. واضح طلاب؟ دكتور بس الكوكس 1 والكوكس 2 شنو وظيفتها بالفيفر؟ The cyclooxygenase uh, this is the enzyme cyclooxygenase that will we have two types of cyclooxygenase COX1 and COX2 in the pharmacology right? The substrate for cyclooxygenase is arachidonic acid arachidonic acid from the cell membrane. And this, rele and this release of, the, of uh, cyclooxygenase is the rate limiting step in the synthesis of prostaglandin E2. Well, the prostaglandin E2, 
So uh, the cyclooxygenases will produce by the, by synthesis of prostaglandin E2 from the cell membrane. So prostaglandin E2 is the substrate for cyclooxygenases, either COX1 or COX2. If we inhibit this enzyme cyclooxygenase, COX1 or COX2, it will block the synthesis of prostaglandin E2, which is an important mediator of fever. And there are two enzymes, cyclooxygenases. These are powerful or potent antipyretics, these oxygenases, it's because it will produce the prostaglandin E2, which is an important mediator in the Prostaglandin E2 has receptors in the hypothalamic set point. So once prostaglandin E2 bind to the hypothalamic set point, it will rise the temperature. If we block the synthesis of prostaglandin E2, how? By blocking the cyclooxygenase, COX1 or COX2, it will result in decrease the synthesis of prostaglandin E2 and thus will reset the hypothalamic set point to normal. واضح لحد الآن؟ ميكانيزم؟ In the fever, we are in the hypothalamus by production of prostaglandin E2. How we block the synthesis of prostaglandin? Because if we decrease the synthesis of prostaglandin E2, we are going to reach the hypothalamic set point to the normal by using inhibitors of cyclooxygenase. واضح لحد الآن؟ واضح واضح كثير. Okay. زين. Uh, we have to move to the second part of the lecture, which is fever of unknown origin. So we have no clues about the origin of the fever. Fever of unknown origin. Indeed, it is uh, described initially by two scientists, Petersdorf and Payson, in 1961, who first described this term, pyrexy of unknown origin. And the other terms, fever, either fever or pyroxy of unknown origin. How we can define the fever of unknown origin? So it is fever of more than 38.3 on at least two occasions. Number two, the illness duration should be more than three weeks. Third, no known immune compromised state. This is the definition of a classic FUO, fever of unknown origin. Because uh, if a fever develops in immune compromised state, we call it fever of an, an immune compromised state. So it is not a classical FUO. We have FUO in immune compromised state, FUO in HIV, and a classical FUO. So this is the definition of classical FUO, fever of unknown origin. So fever, illness duration, no known immune compromised state. Diagnosis that remains uncertain after a thorough history taking, physical examination, and performing a, an obligatory investigation. So you should fulfill all these criteria. Fever, illness duration, the immune compromise or not, and performing history, examination, and obligatory investigations. So this is the definition of 38 point, the definition of fever of unknown origin. Wadah, municipal high four criteria. You should fulfill these criteria in order to say that the patient has fever of unknown origin. What about the etiology of fever of unknown origin? As you see in the diagram, infectious causes remain the most common cause of fever of unknown origin. So infection, infection still remain the most prevalent cause of the underlying cause of pyrexia of unknown origin. The other category is malignancy and connective tissue disease. This scheme is a general scheme, but it will differ and depends on the geographical area, the age of the patient, and the prevalence of certain diseases. For example, in pediatric and adolescent, infectious causes remain the same, the proportion of it. By far, it will be the most common. But in advancing age, 
the, the proportion of connective tissue disorders, for example, polyomalgia aromatica, giant cell arthritis will rise and will reach about 25%. And malignancy will also increase. And for example, infection to reach 25, malignancy 24, connective tissue disease 20. And this, the miscellaneous causes will decrease. But in general, infectious will be uh, the most important one, followed by malignancy and connective tissue, disease, tissue disorders. So in every patient presented with pyrexia of unknown origin, we have to rule out infections before we can consider malignancy and other connective tissue disorders. So what about the clinical assessment? The differential diagnosis for this condition is extensive. And it is very important to remember that PO is far more often caused by an atypical presentation of a rather common disease rather than by a very rare disease. So it is an atypical manifestation of common disease rather than rare entity of diseases. Yeah, I'm in for curable rare diseases for infectious causes. TB in Iraq is a very common cause for pyrexia of unknown origin. It will present all you with fever with no diagnostic clues. For example, cough, headache, abdominal pain, just fever. So tuberculosis in Iraq, very important. Another common etiology is infective endocarditis, also important cause of fever of unknown origin. And other disease in Iraq, for example, brucellosis is also present with a fever of unknown origin. Followed by hidden abscesses, for example, splenic abscess, liver abscess, renal abscess, and bone abscess, for example, osteomyelitis, may produce only with fever, especially in the vertebral column, spondylodiscitis. Sometimes the patient will not complain of back pain, it's only fever. And how to think about a patient presented with fever of an origin. So you have to put in mind that it is usually manifestation of a common disease rather than a rare disease. So, how we can reach a diagnosis? History, history, and history. History is very important here. So, detailed history followed by proper examination that should be repeated at regular intervals because sometimes we face a patient with fever with no any abnormalities after extensive examinations. So, everything is normal, just fever. But with the time, if we follow the patient, we have to detect an emerging science that may pinpoint certain diagnosis. For example, a patient presented with fever, if we examine it over several days, everything is normal. After one week, two weeks, we may, uh, show, we may detect signs of, for example, infective endocarditis by looking to its nails. And for example, splinter hemorrhage or Genoa lesions. So this may pinpoint to diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Auscultation of the heart, initially normal, but with the repeated examinations, we may detect a new murmur. What is the meaning of repeated regular intervals for examination and history taking? Is it clear? In respect to the how we can approach to a patient with fever of unknown origin, detailed history and examination should be repeated at regular intervals. So the patient may miss information initially about the history. So the repeated history taking day by day, asking the relatives, asking the patient, travel, the patient may remember something that is forgetting initially. Similarly, examinations, if we examine the patient initially, we may don't find any potential clues for the infectious cause because everything is normal. But with the time, we may detect an emerging signs. For example, the presence of a skin rash, presence of lymphadenopathy, presence of new murmur that may pinpoint to a diagnosis. So a thorough history should include the following information, localizing symptoms, in each region, 
any headache, any sinus pain, any abdominal pain, any chest pain, even subtle sign. I go like, for example, a little bit of a headache, a little bit of a headache, a little bit of a headache. This may give a clue toward the diagnosis of a certain infection, for example, meningitis or encephalitis or respiratory issues. Or a certain infection, for example, meningitis or encephalitis or renal abscess. Important travel history, not recently, but also on the remote, because some infections may take long incubation period to be manifested. For example, in malaria, even the patient has travel history, for example, five to six years ago, it may show infections recently. Animal exposure, whether it is sick animal or healthy animal, for example, in the pets, or occupational exposure to animal, or living in a farm, exposure to livestock, and whether the patient is immune compromised or not, which is very important, because immune compromised patient has predilection to atypical infections. And these atypical infections, the whole manifestation of them are fever. And very important, whether the patient exposed to drugs, because some one, one of the causes of fever is drug fever. Some drugs may produce fever. For example, antibiotic by itself may cause fever. Allopurinol will also cause fever. So this is a usual and adverse drug reaction of medication. Drug fever. Do you know this term, drug fever? Pinacatobal pharmacology, drug fever. Toxin exposures, including the antimicrobials. So the thorough history, you should evaluate the localizing system by evaluating the system, systematic review. We have in the history, the systematic review, the cardiovascular, the respiratory, the GIT, the genitourinary, the musculoskeletal. We have, and so the patient presented with fever of known origin, you have to review the systematic review in order to obtain a potentially diagnostic symptom to go through this symptom and analyze it well. And the past medical history, looking for any immune compromising state or underlying immune compromising state, for example, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, right? Any hemato, any known history of malignancy, for example, leukemia, lymphoma, or solid tumors. Whether the patient taking an immunosuppressing drugs. Do you know any immunosuppressing drug? Corticosteroid. Yes, glucocorticoids, number one. Bye. Any chemotherapy? Yes, the chemotherapy. It will produce bone marrow suppression and make the patient liable for infections. Yes. So the most important step in the diagnostic workup is the search for potentially diagnostic clues in a patient presented with fever with no focus of infection. Potentially diagnostic clues are defined as localizing signs or symptoms. And the abnormalities potentially, any other abnormalities potentially pointing toward a diagnosis. For example, a certain skin rash. There are some rashes that are diagnostic of certain infections. Or the presence of nail changes, for example, splinter hemorrhage or genuine lesions. These are some potentially diagnostic clues that aid in the diagnosis of the underlying cause of infection. So what are the obli obli after, after we thorough, obtaining thorough history and examination, if we didn't reach a diagnosis, we have to fulfill these investigations. First of all, the ASR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Though it is non-specific for a certain disease, but if the ASR is very high, more than 100, it may pinpoint to, in Iraq, for example, tuberculosis. So the patient presented with fever and very high ASR, more than 100, we have, an as an infectious cause, we have to rule out tuberculosis. Especially if the patient has cough and have contact with the patient with tuberculosis. Recently. C-reactive protein is also a marker of infection, but it's then specific. Follow blood count, 
and differential is very important, sorry. Uh, full blood count and differential. Do you know whether there is neutrophilic, lymphocytic? Alkytrolytes, creatinine, total protein, liver enzymes, maybe elevated in hepatic abscess, or in hepatitis. Lactate dehydrogenase is also useful in patients with underlying malignancy, for example, in lymphoma. Creatinine kinase, especially in patients with infectious pyomyositis, it will be very high. Ferritin is also an specific marker because it, uh, any infection, since it is an acute phase reactant, it will produce a variety of infections. It will be high. But if it is very high, especially when it exceeds one, more than 1,000, we have to think about rheumatic diseases as underlying cause of fever of an origin, for example, in adult stills disease. In such condition, the ferritin will be very high, more than 1,000, and it rarely reach such level in other diseases, infectious diseases. Also, we have to uh, order an antinuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, serum protein electrophoresis, urinalysis, and blood cultures, very important, blood cultures. In every patient, fever and of origin, we have to obtain at least three blood cultures at different times in order to yield the result of bacteria. Urine culture, so blood culture and urine culture. And if the patient have cough, for example, we have to do sputum culture accordingly. Tubercarine skin test, chest x-ray and abdominal ultrasonography. If they are normal, we may order compute tomography scan of the abdomen and chest. So in general, these are the obligatory investigations in a patient with presented with fever of unknown origin. Well, obligatory investigations. And by the end of these investigations and reviewing the history and examination, we may reach a diagnosis. We may reach a diagnosis. Not all the things. So what about the outcome? No cause is found in approximately 10% of FUR, despite extensive investigations and thorough history and examination. Every time we examine the patient, we take another history if there is emerging symptoms, for example, cough, dysuria, loin pain, headache, nothing is found. Uh, but we, the only thing present is fever. The investigations didn't reveal anything specific. So no cause is found in approximately 10% of FUO. And it depends on the um, locality. Here in Iraq, it may be more than this number. This number is in UK. In Iraq, I think it is more than 10%, may reach to 30 to 40%. So no cause is found. So the good news are as long as there is no significant weight loss or signs of another disease, the long-term mortality is low. So if the patient has only fever, everything is normal, study examinations, imaging tests, all everything is normal, the outcome is good. As far as there is no weight loss or other signs of diseases, of another disease. For example, lymphoma, only fever, no localizing symptoms or signs. So the outcome, the prognosis of FUO is usually good, provided there is no significant weight loss. Why? Because significant weight loss, it may underlie, it may pinpoint to underlying malignancy or rheumatic diseases or infections. Which infection produce Severe weight loss, do you know? An infection produced significant weight Correct. loss in Iraq? Tuber <laughs> yes, tuberculosis, number one. Brucella is another cause for significant weight loss, although it is less common than TB. Infective endocarditis, these are uh, uh, infections that produce weight loss. But the number one is tuberculosis in Iraq here. Doctor, the parasite may cause weight loss? Yes, it may cause weight loss. But it is usually, most of the parasitic infections, usually fever is not prominent as the bacterial infections. And for example, ascariasis, strongyloidosis, may produce fever, yes, but it is usually not as common as the bacterial or fungal infections. So most of the parasitic infection will produce mal-absorptive features, for example, diarrhea. 
So fever is usually uncommon in contrast to the bacterial infections. Malaria is another example for a fever of unknown origin. Very important to rule out if the patient has traveling history. Sometimes the patient didn't remember. So the other concept is empirical therapeutic trials with antibiotics, glucocorticoid, and antitubercular agent should be avoided in PUR, except when the patient's condition is rapidly deteriorating. So we have not to give antibiotics, steroids, or antitubercular empirically, unless the patient is condition is very critical. So the patient, healthy, just fever, he has good functional status. We have to follow the patient by ordering to measure temperature and educate the patient how to measure the temperature about four times per day. And when the patient feels fever, you have to measure his temperature in order to document fever. As far as the patient condition as well, you should avoid prescribing antibiotics because when we prescribe antibiotics, we mod may modify the underlying cause of fever and decrease the yield of blood culture or urine culture. But in certain conditions, for example, in a patient with extra pulmonary or pulmonary TB, when the, for example, radiological picture give a, us as a hint, exposure history, high ESR, and the patient in this respiratory failure, we may give a trial of anti-tuberculosis the drug therapy. Or glucocorticoid, when you give empirically glucocorticoid, glucocorticoids may be given in a patient with suspected giant cell arthritis. It is an aromatic disease that affects the vessels, the arteries of the brain. If we suspect this patient and if we suspect this disease and wait for the final diagnostic result, the patient will result in, will end with blindness and stroke. So once you suspect, you may treat him with high dose glucocorticoids. So these are exceptions, but in general, we should avoid give glucocorticoid or anti-TB unless we reach a diagnosis. What <clears throat> how we can treat empirically? In a patient to that you are glucocorticoid no, I am talking about the giant cell arthritis. This is, a, uh, this is a rheumatic disease in the entity of vasculitis. So vasculitis, which is an inflammation of the vessels, best treated with steroid, not the non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Wawa, this is a life-threatening condition. So if you have a life-threatening condition, you have to treat the underlying cause, which is the inflammation, treated by steroid. This is an exception. Usually the other rheumatic disease, for example, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is the first sign treatment is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs father but in a special situation we may give glucocorticoids if the patient has life threatening organ if we have high index of suspicion if the patient presented with headache very high ESR for example, negative meningeal signs, his age more than 65, which are all the patterns, the presentation of giant cell arthritis. Giant cell arthritis, arthritis is a disease of elderly, more than 65, usually presented with high-grade fever, loss of appetite, high ESR, and, some, and with headache. So when you examine him, nothing is obvious. The patient is complaining also only with headache, plus minus with fever. So if you suspect ESR, for example, 120, headache, we exclude other infections that come only, for example, TB, we may treat him with empirically with high dose steroid, then we may arrange a temporal artery biopsy to reach the diagnosis. So if we don't give the patient, the patient will end with the blindness because the vasculitis will affect the central retinal artery and will produce blindness. So this is an exception. Otherwise, we have to follow the patient, examine him, take history, and look for the potentially diagnostic clues. 
واضح طلاب بالنسبة لل empirical treatment of FUO this is very important concept so by this slide I will conclude my lecture and if you have any further comments or questions about the lecture as a whole دكتور نعم إبراهيم دكتور هل البيفا مو ديفنس ميكانيزم ليش دائما نريد نتخلص من عدها؟ يعني دا سمع نسمع انه هو بريفيس وات واز ثوت لايك ذيس بس اتس نوت ا ديفنس ميكانيزم ناو ديز فيفر يعني تريتينج فيفر اور نوت تريتينج ات ويل يعني اوفر كم اوفر ذا اوت كم اوف ذا بيشنت ات ويل ريمين ذا سيم اوكي انليس ان سبيسيفيك سيركمستانسز فور اكزامبل كارديك ديزيز قلناها الريسبيراتوري ديزيز البيشنت وذ سيجرز اذروايز تريتينج اور نوت تريتينج ذا فيفر will not affect the outcome, but will it affect the evaluation of the patient and response to antibiotics. For example, patient with pyelonephritis, treat him with an antibiotic, we have to follow the fever. But if we give, a, the, an, uh, if we give an antibiotic, we cannot follow the, the patient properly with fever, because, uh, right? because giving antibiotic will mask the development of fever. But it 